Good morning and welcome to the FlowTech Industries fourth quarter and full year 2022 conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Bernie Colson, Senior Vice President at of Corporate Development and Sustainability. Please go ahead. Thank you and good morning, everyone. We appreciate your participation. Joining me today and participating in the call are Harsha Viagati, Interim Chief Executive Officer, Ryan Ezel, President, and Bon Clement, Chief Financial Officer. On today's call, we will first provide prepared remarks concerning our business and results for the quarter and the full year. Following that, we will answer any questions you have. We have now released our earnings announcement for the full year and fourth quarter of 2022, which is available on our website. In addition, today's call is being webcast and a replay will be available on our website shortly following the conclusion of this call. Please note that comments we make on today's call regarding projections or our expectations for future events are forward-looking statements. Forward-looking statements are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties, many of which are beyond our control. These risks and uncertainties can cause actual results to differ materially from our current expectations. We advise listeners to review our earnings release and the risk factors discussed in our filings with the SEC. Also, please refer to the reconciliations provided in our earnings press release as management may discuss non-GAAP metrics on this call. I will now turn it over to Arsha. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the discussion of our fourth quarter and full year 2022 financial results. This is my first conference call as interim CEO, and I'm happy to be here today. I have been a member of the board of directors since August 2020, and have never been more encouraged about the present and future outlook of Flowtech. Flowtech has taken decisive steps to position the company for future growth and profitability with a new senior management team in place. As you may recall, Bon Clement was appointed Chief Financial Officer in December of 2022. In January, I was appointed as Interim CEO. We promoted Ryan Ezel to President, and David Nirenberg assumed the role of Chairman of the Board. We believe we have the right management team and board of directors to guide Flowtech to enhance revenue and profitability. This is my 62nd day since the changes, and I'm learning every single day how we can grow this company. What I know so far is that the Flowtech team is world-class and has overseen top-line growth. Going forward, we have made profitability enhancement the absolute cornerstone of our strategy. Fourth quarter 2022 revenue grew 4x over the fourth quarter of 2021. This was accomplished while maintaining extremely high service quality, customer satisfaction, and industry-leading safety. The effort has been nothing short of Herculean. And I would like to congratulate and thank all of our employees, suppliers, and customers for their role in our 2022 growth story. That being said, I'm even more excited about the future runaway for our company. I am confident that we will continue to drive peer-leading revenue and market share growth, and we are approaching an inflection point where the company will shift to generating positive adjusted EBITDA through various cost reduction initiatives that are now in place. Our economies of scale in purchasing raw materials, improved efficiency in freight costs, 
and introducing just-in-time labor scheduling will make a significant difference in gross margins over time. Brian will quantify those later. In addition, reductions in SGNA combined with top-line growth will drive us to word positive cash generation. Bond will quantify SGNA savings. All these initiatives are now in place. It gives me great comfort and pleasure to have a seasoned and experienced oil field services executive like Dr. Ryan Izel to lead our company operations towards sustainable top line and bottom line growth. He and his team have done a tremendous job executing a strategy that has resulted in transformational growth in our chemistry and data analytics business. I do want to state that as the interim CEO, there are significant growing pains as businesses scale up in working capital, gross margins, and limited financial staff to execute perfectly. As the new senior team, we recognize the growing pains are investing and investing in resources to correct it. I'm highly confident that revenues in 2023 will be up at least 50% over 2022. Our continued scaling of revenues, increased gross margins combined with tight-fisted control on SGNA will lead us to sustainable positive adjusted EBITDA. The board, senior management, most importantly, all employees are very excited with this positive outlook on our business. In conclusion, as the interim CEO, when I assumed this position in January, I knew I had a learning curve to better understand the culture of the company, the sector, and its employees. The people of this company are very impressive and dedicated. There is work to be done on all fronts and we are addressing it confidently. With that, I ask our president, Dr. Ryan Ezel, to discuss our operational results for 2022. Ryan? Thank you, Harsha, and good morning. This quarter represents another progressive step for Flowtech as revenue growth in both chemistry and data analytics segments continue to expand, further solidifying that our strategy to be the collaborative partner of choice for sustainable, optimized chemistry and data solutions is working. Let's get right to the fourth quarter operational highlights. Total company revenue increased 300% year over year and 6% sequentially, equating to our highest quarterly company revenues in over four years. Low tech market share of active U.S. frac fleet served grew to 10.8% at the end of Q4, which marks a 28% increase sequentially and an over 10x increase year over year. We added the full chemistry servicing of five additional pro frac fleets in Q4, which is a 31% improvement sequentially. This brings our total to 21 fleets as we continue to ramp our, to our contractual target of over 30 fleets. Our transactional chemistry technologies revenue growth outpaced the hydraulic fracturing fleet market growth for the sixth straight quarter, further indicating that we are gaining market share with our customized chemistry solutions. Our data analytics segment revenue grew 245% versus the prior year and 20% sequentially. Our focus on core applications continues to gain traction, coupled with the momentum gained from the successful monitoring of field gas quality by our Varex analyzers. Our industry research shows that maximizing the use of field gas can result in reduction of diesel fuel consumption and the resultant greenhouse emissions by over 50%. Most importantly, the growth milestones presented above were achieved with zero recordable and lost time incidences in the field of operations. I'm pleased with the solid performance Flowtech delivered in the fourth quarter of this year, and I want to thank all Flowtech employees for their hard work and contribution to these outstanding results and the dedication to collaboration, safety, and service quality. Now transitioning into a few of the key details for the quarter, I'd like to discuss the status of our mutually beneficial partnership with Profrac. As a reminder, 
Our contract with Profrac was effective as of April 1, 2022, and it spans 10 years and covers an equivalent volume of our full suite of downhole chemistries to serve 30 of their hydraulic fracturing fleets or 70% of their total fracturing fleets, whichever is greater. We achieved 21 fleets in December, and we remain confident that we will achieve the full contract scope over the coming quarters. In the spirit of our long-term partnership with Profrac, we executed an amendment to the current scope by extending the ramp period by one quarter for Profrac while allowing Flotec to receive compensation for build services for the entire life of the contract. Thus, collaboration is further evidence that the mutually beneficial contract and nature of the agreement coupled with Flotec's focus on service quality and innovative solutions will enhance shareholder value creation for years to come. As we've been saying, this agreement is proving to be transformational for Flotech and the industry. As a result of this agreement, EMPs now have a comprehensive, vertically integrated completion solution that reduces emissions and delivers greener chemistries, thereby protecting air, water, land, and people. Over the next decade, we anticipate the agreement should create a backlog of more than $2 billion in revenue for Flotech including anticipated revenues in excess of $200 million in 2023 for the Profrac contract alone. And this number does not include any of the impact from Profrac's recent acquisitions. I will also continue to stress that the contract is non-exclusive, allowing us to add new customers and continue to grow sales volumes to the rest of our energy chemistry customers, which we've successfully done for six consecutive quarters. We are laser focused on growing this higher margin, higher value add portion of our business, and we continue to make steady progress in growing this market share and outpacing industry activity levels. In the spirit of reducing costs and improving margins, we've executed the following actions as part of our multidisciplinary approach to sustainable margin enhancement. First, we reduced headcount by an additional 12% since the end of Q3 2022 while continuing to grow our revenue and market share. We've realigned our manufacturing staff, field personnel, and 24-hour logistics coverage to systematically reduce overtime hours by almost 40%. Our plant utilization is up 50% year-on-year, driving our manufacturing cost per pound of production down 37%. As of February, we have our in-basin support facilities up and running in all major basins, which will drive improvements in freight and material handling for all areas of operation. We also terminated the majority of our dedicated trucking contracts as they were underutilized, and, have, and we have now transferred to a digitized trucking dispatch and route optimization system. We expect a net improvement of over 20% in logistics. We continue to leverage our growing economies of scale to retender and drive overall materials cost improvements. Additionally, we're currently undergoing a continuous improvement exercise of our entire chemicals portfolio, validating our sourcing strategies and identifying vertical integration possibilities to improve capital management. We've also executed a supply agreement in our data analytics segment that will not only improve our manufacturing costs, but it will also generate security supply for our proprietary JP3 sensors for real-time monitoring of hydrocarbons. And finally, we've outlined an exit plan from our current corporate office footprint in Houston to a more fit-for-purpose facility that will take place in the second half of 2023. In total, these actions are expected to deliver approximately $18 million in cost reductions. And despite seasonal disruption in December that has extended in the start of Q1 of 2023, we continue to believe that the underlying market fundamentals stay strong as the supply of hydrocarbons remains tight to under, due to underinvestment in infrastructure and new sources of oil and gas production. Additionally, EMPs have remained focused on capital discipline despite healthy oil prices and increased demand projections in 2023. The industry's demand for services, returns focus, and capital discipline plays well to our strategy of being the collaborative partner of choice to producers as our solutions solve for maximizing total well production while reducing the overall carbon footprint and not simply just minimizing costs. Our producer customers report achieving better well performance with Flotec chemistry and data analytics when all else being equal. I continue to be optimistic about the future, and I'm excited about our mission to provide differentiated solutions that maximize value to our customers. Simply speaking, we're focused on protecting water quality, minimizing formation damage, 
and improving the estimated ultimate recovery of every completion while maintaining our commitment to corporate responsibility, market share growth, and SG&A discipline. Now, I'll turn the call over to Bond to provide key financial highlights. Thanks, Ryan. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you for my first conference call at Flowtech. It's really exciting to be part of a company that is essentially no leverage, a backlog of revenue roughly 20 times the current market cap, and an outstanding team of professionals with deep expertise in logistics, supply chain management, data analytics, and, of course, chemistry. I echo Ryan's comments on the fourth quarter achievements, and I am very excited about the direction we're now heading. As it relates to getting to positive adjusted EBITDA, I want to focus my comments this morning on SG&A and professional fee cost reductions. Ryan and his team have made great progress moving us toward profitability at the gross margin level, and concurrent with this work, we'll focus on attacking the SG&A of this company to ensure that we achieve bottom line profitability this year. You may have noticed we included a new metric in the press release called adjusted gross profit. Non-cash amortization of our contract asset reduces both revenue and gross profit. We believe the new metric provides a more accurate representation of the performance of the business. While reported gross margin for the quarter was negative 2.1 million, on a cash basis, we were 75% better than that at negative 500,000. Certainly more work to do, but we are getting close. Fourth quarter adjusted EBITDA improved 40% sequentially as we continue to march toward turning that metric positive during 2023. This marked the sixth consecutive quarter of improvement in adjusted EBITDA as a percentage of revenue. Again, more work to do, but we're moving in the right direction. SG&A during the fourth quarter also showed improvement as it declined 36% sequentially. It's worth highlighting that third quarter 2022, SG&A included about 900,000 in non-recurring professional fees, roughly half of which were related to evaluating an ABL, ABL structure that the company ultimately decided not to pursue. Third quarter 2022 SG&A also included a 1.9 million accrual related to potential year-end performance bonuses. To add a component of protection to our resources, we decided to reduce and restructure this bonus to focus on retaining key employees that are necessary to create shareholder value and achieve profitability. As a result, we reversed the 1.9 million performance bonus accrual during the fourth quarter. During March, we plan to pay $1.2 million of retention bonuses with the condition that recipients are required to remain with the company through the end of 2023 or be subject to a prorated clawback. As a result of this service condition, the $1.2 million will be expensed evenly throughout the final three quarters of 2023. We believe having a more narrowly focused retention bonus is far better for shareholders than an organizationally broad performance bonus with no clawback protections. As it relates to the annual increase in SG&A in 2021 versus 2021, keep in mind last year's number included a 2.9 million credit for a COVID-related ERC payroll credit. So to bridge the 2022 full-year SG&A increase versus 2021, we had the payroll tax credit in 21 plus 3 million in non-recurring fees in 2022 directly related to the PROFRAC agreement, which I'll discuss further in a moment. The combination of just these two items accounts for nearly six million of the SG&A variants between 22 and 21. As it relates to 23 SG&A, since the third quarter, we've executed on headcount reductions, as Ryan mentioned, dropping full-time employees by 12%. These headcount reductions include numerous management level positions. In connection with these staffing reductions, we expect to expense approximately $2.9 million in separation costs during the first quarter of 2023. This amount includes $1.5 million related to the former CEO that was previously disclosed. The bulk of the remaining $1.4 million of non-CEO related separation costs will be paid evenly over the next 12 months as stipulated in the governing agreements. Excluding separation costs, annual salary and benefit savings from headcount reductions are expected to total approximately $5 million. In addition to reevaluating corporate staffing, we are aggressively pursuing ways to reduce professional fees that have historically been too high at this company. As mentioned earlier, during 2022, there were nearly 3 million of professional fees, primarily banking, legal, and accounting, directly associated with the PROFRAC supply agreement that will not be duplicated this year. 
While expensive on an absolute basis, when you consider the cost in light of securing a $2 billion contract, those transaction fees equate to only about 15 basis points before discounting the contract value. The elimination of just the non-recurring PROFRAC contract cost represents a roughly 30% reduction in 2022 professional fees. In terms of professional fees moving forward, we have implemented enhanced monitoring and approval processes to ensure that future engagements of any professionals require executive level approval. Finally, we are working to reduce our wedge of consultant costs by bringing certain full-time roles in-house and realizing overhead savings. By the fourth quarter of this year, we expect SG&A, including professional fees, to be less than 10% of revenues. While that level is generally accepted on a relative basis, we endeavor to continue looking for ways to reduce the absolute dollars of SG&A. Quickly moving to the balance sheet, as noted during the quarter, we closed on the sale of our Monahans Texas facility, resulting in net proceeds of $1.5 million. We continue to execute well during the quarter in terms of converting orders to cash. Our cash balance at year end increased to about $12.3 million versus cash at the end of the third quarter of $8.5 million. Cash balances, of course, will fluctuate with the ebbs and flows of working capital. As activity and related revenues increase with additional fleets added to our chemistry delivery, we will continue to focus on managing working capital by timing our collections inside of the favorable pay terms we've negotiated with our suppliers. To augment our working capital management, we have renewed our efforts to attain an ABL supported by our receivables and or our inventory to provide additional liquidity. Initial discussions with lenders have been positive and we're currently working through various creditor diligence requests. We'll update the market and have further updates as this process progresses. On the debt front, as mentioned in the release, we were notified during January that all but approximately 400,000 of our PPP loan was forgiven. The balance of the loan carries a 1% interest rate and will be amortized over the next 24 months. In yesterday's release, we provided an update regarding our certain items associated with our year-end audit in 10K. We did identify a material weakness in our internal controls over financial reporting as of year-end. Unfortunately, the 300% growth in our business from a year ago has had some unintended consequences in terms of the stress placed on our back office staff charged with managing the increased operational activity. We are implementing enhanced processes to shore up internal communications and augment our staff in certain areas to provide additional resources to ensure that our controls are operating effectively. We believe this issue will be quickly remediated. As it relates to the going concern qualification and the related disclosures we expect to make in our 10K, we're working to secure additional sources of liquidity, as we just discussed, in terms of an ABL. Additionally, as stated throughout today's call, we're taking positive steps toward profitability. We expect to achieve positive adjusted EBITDA during 2023, as opposed to continuing our historical trend of operating losses. We believe our efforts to manage cash and working capital, combined with an improving cash flow outlook, provides us with sufficient financial resources to continue to operate the business. With that, I'll turn it over to Harsha for closing comments. Thank you, Bond. I have never been so positive on Flowtech. I am encouraged by the robust revenue backlog, and I'm optimistic about our ability to convert revenue growth into earnings going forward. In conclusion, on the revenue front, our anchor customer, Profrac, is continuing to ramp up and giving us increasing business. Our transactional business pipeline is now over $100 million, and JP3 has robust demand in 2023 and beyond. Regarding margins, we are aggressively moving towards profitability on four fronts in 2023. Revenue optimization of $8 million, headcount reduction of $5 million, professional fees savings of $3 million, supply chain efficiencies of $13 million, all of which has been detailed by Ryan and Bond. I want to thank all of the employees of Flowtech for having a fanatical focus on execution and cost management in 2023 and beyond. 
We are now open to your questions or comments. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, you will need to pick up the handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Once again, that was star then one to ask a question, and at this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. And our first question will come from Don Christ of Johnson Rice. Please go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, Hi, Don. It is truly commendable what y'all have done, and I appreciate all the color that y'all provided on this call so far. Uh, maybe my first one for, for Ryan. You know, as you have ramped up uh, supplying the ACDC fleets or the Profract fleets, uh, you've had to do a lot of in-basin work to, to streamline operations and, and, and get everything operating properly. Where, where are you in that process? And number two, um, when do you think that you'll get to the, to the contracted 30 fleets? Um, so I'll take those, kind of break them apart in the, in, the, in the ways you presented it. So when we look at it at the mobilization components, um, in Q4, because we're getting solid traction on the way that we're ramping. Um, we've now fully executed delivery points in the Northeast, West Texas, South Texas, and the Permian Basin, particularly focused in Cambridge, Ohio, Kilgore, Texas, Corpus Christi, and in Midland. And so that, that's going to help accelerate. We took a little extra cost in Q4 because we were really happy with how fast we're ramping, and we brought those costs into Q4 so that we have a clean run in 2023 on the mobilizations. We also went ahead and completed the mobilization of the additional tanks required to service the 30 fleets and brought those into play in, uh, at the end of December and carried that cost as well in, the, in Q4. So when I look at where we want to be ramped at getting to that contractual 30 fleets, we expect to be there around mid-year, um, maybe a little earlier. And I, I think we're in a very good position to, uh, to service all 30. And from that point on, I hope we're not limited by the 30 and we grow past that. But I think we're in, a, we're in a great position now, and we've taken the burden of the cost on the mobilization, and we should, we're leaning up at this point forward. And I think, Don, as Profrac uh, moves into number one position because they're continuing to acquire, continuing to ramp up, I will not be shy in picking up the phone, just like Ryan does, and asking for much more than 30. Nothing stops us from doing more. I, I agree with that. And um, as far as JP3 is concerned, I know your your com comments were a little bit limited in your prepared remarks. W where do we stand in relation to the to the to the Profract contract? You know, supplying 20 fleets. And I know y'all were exploring some opportunities outside of you know traditional uh, completions activity towards you know the compression act compression industry, et cetera. Where are we in those efforts? So looking at the, the PROFRAC initial supply agreement of the uh, 20 units, we're three quarters of the way through that. And we have 12 in operations and we'll be delivering the other ones around mid-year timeframe. Um, and for, for that, uh, it's doing really well. You can start to see now, uh, even on Profrac site, there's discussion of the activity of the JP3 units on their F3 skids and their performance and how it impacts uh, the dual fuel fleets. So we're very happy with the traction that's ongoing there. Uh, and we expect those to continue to grow in terms of field gas monitoring as we have some additional opportunities to deploy units with other hydraulic fracturing fleets. And when we look at the compressed gas, uh, we have some targeted field trials uh, without being specific to the operators there. But we do have targeted field trials for applications of those in H1 of this year and continue to gain traction on that side with JP3. And most importantly, you know, what I want to point out for that is we are transitioning into uh, it's like data as a service more than we are uh, capital sales, which is phenomenal improvements for us in terms of profitability and, and a revenue backlog in that part of the business. 
And I think, Don, uh, Ryan and team have already started, if you will, on the path of subscription service on JP3. So over time, you're going to see more subscription revenue format coming into JP3 that has not happened before. So this is already begun, and the traction is pretty good. And in addition, also the re-engineering efforts that Ryan has conducted will lower our entry point for our customers in a very effective way. I appreciate that. One final one for me for Bond. Uh, the GNA efforts that you've that you've made so far in your short two months that you've been there, or three months that you've been there, is is truly commendable. When do you think you get to that kind of ten percent of revenue? Is that like third quarter or fourth quarter or, or before that? Yeah, Don, I think we're going to get there probably sometime around the third quarter in terms of the revenue growth hitting the 30 frack fleets, obviously, sometime around mid-year is going to be a big driver of that percentage, but certainly uh, fourth quarter for sure, possibly third quarter. I appreciate all the comments and uh, truly commendable what you've done over the past few months. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Don. The next question comes from Jeff Robertson of Water Tower Research. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Ryan, if if Flotech moves some of their frac fleets to, to oil basins from gas, does that have much of an impact on the type of margin for the chemical suite that you provide crews working in those types of formations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because, you know, we've been tracking very – closely um, the the impact of movements from the, the gas basins to the oil basins. I think we do see a slight shift in product mix, um, but I wouldn't say there's a massive change in the profitability, but there is some revenue differential. Um, we run a little bit, if you take, say, for instance, the Haynesville, because we run some hybrid type systems, typically the average revenue per fleet is a little higher in, uh, in East Texas than it is in West Texas. Uh, just because of the basic, more basic slick water system we'd see out in West Texas. So it's more about the revenue and not as much as it would impact the margin per se. And on the, I think you mentioned trucking costs and eliminated your dedicated um, trucking contracts. Is there anything you all can do to leverage with ProFrac or um, trucking needs to maybe so both of you could uh, negotiate uh, savings? You know, that's a, from, from our standpoint, that's exactly what these amendments that we did to the contract has helped us do. So we've been tracking, uh, we brought on a system that was similar to what ProFrac runs in terms of digitized trucking for how they move their sand and a lot of logistical movements that they do. That's helped us validate where we were on our dedicated truck fleet utilization, which led to us terminating uh, some of those contracts and going to a expanded uh, vendor base but on a call-out basis on a digitized trucking route optimization. We've also begun to coordinate as we've now stood up to a substantial number of fleets on how we do pad-to-pad -pad movements and some of the in-basin transfers, and then also our ability to generate services and service revenue for doing that. So I would say we kind of hit it on, on all three fronts in terms of operational efficiency on an optimization point, uh, synergistically working with ProFrac for pad-to-pad -pad movements, and then our ability to transfer and gain service revenue for some of these uh, particular uh, movements that we do now. And so we've, we've hit it on all three fronts from that point. So that integration hopefully saves some costs for, for Flowtech, but it also just increases the coordination and how you're servicing their crews to make their crews more efficient and then hopefully more efficient for the EMP customer as well. Absolutely, and, and we've gone even further um, now that now that we've got uh, a really a good solid three quarters under the belt. We've started looking at other ways that we can improve our service through how we move the, the chemistries, the types of chemistry packages, stage to stage monitoring, and really driving what we look at as the combined value propositions of reduced emissions and ef efficient chemistry utilization. Bond, you, you mentioned. Um... And in your presentation, you note, you note that you all are looking at ABL 
facility to for liquidity. Can you talk about any scale or magnitude of uh, facility you're looking for, and with will that plus the expected um, cost savings, which should convert into EBITDA, you, will that be enough to satisfy the going concern language in your audit? Uh, I'll take the second part first. Yes, uh, we're able to get an ABL, certainly as it relates to uh, alleviating the going concern that our auditors feel that uh, they needed to disclose. I think that it would satisfy that. I don't want to get into the details, Jeff, of uh, of the, the discussions that we're having just because we are sort of in the heat of uh, looking at um, diligence items and expecting some term sheets. So I, I prefer to stay away from what our expectations are regarding the uh, the, uh, the terms. Okay. And just real quick on the material weakness, you said you all have steps in place to, to cure that. So that should that should go away pr- relatively in the near in the near term. Yeah, we think we're going to be able to remediate that very quickly. I mean, effectively, you know, we tripled the workload of the uh, the back office staff. We had some communication breakdowns, and uh, so we're going to augment some of the staff and implement some procedures where people are talking to each other. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question comes from Eric Swergold of Firestorm Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, and welcome, Harsha and Bond, to the team. Uh, two questions. First of, all, first of all, can you go into a little more detail on the amendments uh, with Profrac and how this can help your margins there? And the second is the only thing really missing from this call today is, Harsha, I know this is not your first rodeo of, of bringing companies back uh, from unprofitable to profitable. It might be helpful for some other people who haven't had the chance to meet you yet to, to hear about your experience turning companies around. Thanks. Sure. I think uh, on the amendment, let me address that first. So uh, officially, I got here, I think, January 19th, and the amendment we closed within the very first week. Uh, Profrac recognized uh, how we had stepped up above and beyond to service them, and in appreciation of those efforts and recognition and the kind of service we're giving, they committed to an increase at 40 cents per gallon. And without going into a lot of detail, that's millions of gallons uh, going through. And that has made a significant difference uh, to our business. And in fact, we are now running positive gross margins unlike the past. So that's one very big difference. On top of it, the cost savings and other things will also make a difference. I think in terms of the second question on my own history, I am familiar uh, through a lot of my private equity work and training as well as having been involved with more than one public company at CEO that ratcheting costs down and holding it tight as revenue is increasing is the key to many businesses. And we are singularly focused on getting into positive EBITDA as well as making sure the shareholder experience is robust at Flowtech. So we are doing all of those efforts. I have come into very difficult situations in the past, and we've been able to turn around double and triple EBITDA as well. Now, I will say this. Um, I have been very lucky here walking in that Bond actually was hired before me, And I said to Bond, I think God was looking at us kindly as Bond said yes to coming to work for this company. Ryan, uh, who has been through a lot of pain, has chopped a lot of wood, uh, rightly deserves to be the president of the company, is also extremely able. You know, remember, I'm not from this sector, so there's a lot of learning I got to do. But between Bond and Ryan, they are leading the company Uh, on both sides aggressively, and shareholders will be pleased as each quarter passes. It takes time to get the cuts. We've now put all of it in place, not precisely on day zero of my coming in. It's taken a few weeks, and in some cases a month, but now we're going to start seeing the benefits as each month progresses. I hope I've been very clear. I think uh, the last thing, Eric, is I am also fixated on stock price. 
So to me, that's the ultimate return, and we have got to have positive EBITDA. Price will take care of itself automatically in medium-term uh, settings. So to me, let's focus on EBITDA. Let's get the top line continuing to move, and eventually the stock price will follow. Thank you. Thanks very much. Also, can you comment on uh, ownership at the at the board level? I know uh, the chairman has bought stock quite a few times, and I know there was a, a, a time about a year plus ago that you also added a, a stake in the company. Can you comment on board ownership? Thanks. Sure. Uh, the board is committed very much, and the executives, at owning more stock as well as buying stock, more importantly. Uh, we've gone through, I'll call it a series of closed windows, but I think we're going to be opening that up so we will all have an opportunity and you should see a demonstration of us buying our own stock uh, as executives, as board members. So you'll see that step up and frankly, it's good value. So to me, uh, this is actually some of the best time to buy, as you know. There are strict SEC guidelines on open and closed windows. We will examine that shortly, and as far as I can tell, we should be able to open it up here pretty quickly. So I think that also will be very positive. And I have always bought stock of the company I work with. That's been my consistent practice, both private as well as public. It's been a very helpful call. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Eric, for your support, as well as Don and others uh, for continuing to believe in Flowtech. And the team itself is very, very strong. I think we may have one more question. The next question is a follow-up from Jeff Robertson of Water Tower Research. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ryan. Just as a follow-up, you mentioned in, uh, increasing the Flotex capacity for in basin supply and number of delivery points is that are those delivery points also helping you all seek out third party transactional business one hundred as you look out in twenty three that is one hundred percent and you mentioned and I mentioned in my comments how it was impacting the overall business it allows us to locally blend consolidate materials deliver buy off rail spurs, et cetera. And so it helps the growth on all aspects of the business, including supporting our JP3 operations. So it's cost benefit plus increased ability to serve more customers. So you get kind of a double benefit from it. 100%. And that's a big thing because, you know, during the downturns, we consolidated in facilities to help minimize infrastructure costs. And now on this growth part, this significantly improves our, our ability to service and reduce costs and grow revenue at the same time. Thank you for taking my follow-up. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your support. Uh, I do want to take a minute and thank the investors for their patience, and I do want to thank all the employees for their belief that Flowtech is growing and is turning in the right direction. Thank you and goodbye. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation, and you may now disconnect.